Hello and welcome to Game Sack. We are talking about the Game Boy. This is going to be one amazing episode. And as we do with system episodes, let's just hand it right over to Joe to explain all about the system. A little about it. Anyway, here's some stuff about the Game Boy. Just enough. The Nintendo Game Boy. The Game Boy was launched in 1989 to critical and public acclaim and came packaged with Tetris for $89. The system was Nintendo's first portable to use interchangeable cartridges. It featured similar controls to the popular NES and a black and white screen 2.6 inches in size with a resolution of 160 by 144. The Game Boy was a runaway smash hit and saw many game releases as well as revisions to the hardware itself. The system ran on an 8-bit CPU running at 4.19 MHz, could put 40 sprites on screen and featured 4-channel stereo sound. Game Boy games could also be played in peripherals like the Super Game Boy for the Super NES or the Game Boy Player for the GameCube. The original Super Game Boy, the one that was released in the US, plays games at the wrong speed however. But the Game Boy Player and the Super Game Boy 2 which was released in Japan both fixed the issue. The system was in the spotlight for over 8 years before being succeeded by the Game Boy Color. And that is pretty impressive. Wow, Joe, that was really interesting. Four whole channels of sound on that thing? Amazing. Amazing. One less than the NES, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a good quality video like usual, but I'm a bit surprised that you actually didn't take the system apart and show the innards like you do with other systems. Well, that's because I don't have a uh, tri-wing security bit, the I guess Triforce. they call it. What well, they call Triforce bit. Yeah, stupid <laughs> Nintendo. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to break your Game Boy. Well, I do appreciate <laughs> that. That's, that's very kind of you, but yeah. uh, also kudos for using the Game Boy camera. That was cool. Anyway, let's just get right on into the Game Boy games themselves. You've got the first one. Ooh, let's right. go. Burai Fighter Deluxe is a shooter by Taxan. This is a port of Burai Fighter on the NES. This one's called Deluxe because it's in black and white. Just like any shooter out there, your goal is to make it through each stage and fight a boss. The stages are interesting because you'll get to a certain point and then the level will start scrolling backwards and you retrace part of the level and then it will start going forward again. Why it does this I have no idea but I'm guessing it's to lengthen the game overall. You start out with a basic weapon that can shoot in 8 directions. You have auto fire and you can hold your shot in whatever direction you want it to go. It works pretty well for the most part. Along the way you can grab power ups that will give your gun different abilities like a ring, laser and missile shot. These are great and if you power them up enough they'll shoot both in front and behind you. One glaring flaw that I found with this game is that when you fight bosses, you just explode for no reason. It's happened several times and I can't figure out what's going on. Other than that, this is a fun game with a decent soundtrack. Bionic Commando was also ported to the Game Boy. It's basically the same game as its NES counterpart, but with a slightly modified story and sci-fi setting. This has always been a fun game for me, but it's just strange to control. You play as Rad Spencer and for some reason he can't jump. It's a very strange feeling playing an action platformer where your character can't jump. You basically use your bionic arm to get you up on platforms and to help you swing to other ledges. You also have a gun that is necessary to kill the bad guys. Lots of action, good graphics, and a great soundtrack make this a good port. Even though I really struggle with the control scheme, I have a great time. Both of the DuckTales games from the NES got a port to the Game Boy. Let's take a look at DuckTales 2. This is a solid port for the system and just as hard as can be. Again, you play as Scrooge McDuck, out trying to find pieces of a map and collecting a lot of treasure along the way. The game is non-linear and you can pick which area you want to tackle first. Throughout each level you'll find lots of hidden treasure and items. You'll also meet with a lot of your family who will give you hints and information. It's a solid platformer and Scrooge's cane comes in handy. I really like the pogo mechanic and use it all the time. There's other things you can do with the cane like fire cannons or work conveyor belts. With great music and really good graphics this is one you must have in your collection. Dave's talked about the Castlevania adventure before and now it's my turn. This was a launch title and I was already a fan of regular ass Castlevania at the time. 
but this one is different. The first thing you're gonna notice is that it's slow as molasses. I wish they asked Nintendo for a little advice while they were making this. Anyway, now you have ropes instead of stairs and a hitbox that seems larger than your character. The hearts actually refill your life, which is very unusual for a Castlevania game, but it makes sense since there aren't any sub-weapons. Oh, and the game is pretty damn tough. Still, there's something really fun about it even being as frustrating as it is. What keeps me going mainly is the music. It's incredible and it makes great use of this newfangled stereo nonsense that the Game Boy was capable of. This game is definitely worth having. This was followed up with Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge. This one plays at a speed that the original should have and it's actually very refreshing as a result. The sub-weapons are back and that is also welcome and hearts once again act as they do in the rest of the series. You get a stage select right off the bat this time which is yet another welcome feature. Oh, and the graphics are a bit more detailed and the music's even better if you can believe that. But the main problem with this game is the level design. They went way overboard with the ropes. I mean, they really, really like the ropes. It almost feels like you spend more time climbing up or sliding down than you do walking left or right. Is there some technical reason why they couldn't do stairs on the Game Boy versions? Again, the music is what keeps me going here, and it is a good game. Better than the first, but not as good as the NES games. After that, we were blessed with Castlevania Legends. I honestly don't care much for this one. You're just some chick trying to bring peace to Transylvania. That's all the game tells you from the start. The control is okay, and you do move fairly swiftly. There's still ropes here, but they're not spammed all over the place like they were in Ropevania 2. Some candles will warp you into a room where you have to fight mummies, or are they mudmen? I can't tell, and I don't really like this feature at all. The graphics have been scaled back a bit, and even the music is now in mono. Okay, we're almost done with the Castlevania stuff, but we gotta take a quick look at Kid Dracula. In this one, you play as Dracula when he was a little kid. He may be evil, but just look how cute he is! This is probably the best playing Castlevania-related game on the system, honestly. Yeah, it's geared towards a younger audience, but it's just so fun and playable. Anyway, Kid Dracula fires projectiles and he can even shoot up. He can also transform into a bat right at the beginning of the game. But as you advance, you'll gain more powers to help you, like three small bats that attack in a circle. The controls are excellent, and if you die, it's always going to be your fault and something that you can learn from. The graphics have a cartoony look which depict how truly evil Dracula really is. So does the music, which is bouncy and happy, but it's still good. Let me remind you that this is the very character who will in the future beg the question, WHAT IS A MAN? He also has many, many gruesome deaths that he can look forward to. But this game lets you live his life in happier times. For sure, pick it up. Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening was a huge game for the Game Boy and it was huge for me too. You still play as Link in the game, but you're not in Hyrule and you're not after pieces of the Triforce or trying to rescue Princess Zelda. Instead, you're on an island trying to find eight music instruments to wake up the windfish. This entry is everything you'd expect for a Zelda game, and that's awesomeness. It features a large overworld map, eight dungeons to explore, and many secrets to be found. The graphics are great, and Link controls really well. The music is also top-notch with some old melodies you will know, and also a bunch of new tunes that are perfectly enjoyable. I spent tons of time playing this game throughout the years and it still holds up as one of the best titles in the series. If you haven't played this title, then you are definitely missing out. Here's Pokemon Red. I'll be honest and say that I'm not a huge fan of the series. In my entire life, I've probably caught less than 20 Pokemon total. However, while I was playing, I could see the attraction of taking your Pokemon and using them in battle trying to catch other Pokemon. Even battling other trainers was entertaining. 
It feels like a typical RPG with random battles and how your Pokemon level up. I imagine to actually catch all the Pokemon and level them up it would take years. I do like that you can switch between your Pokemon in battles and this will help all of them level up simultaneously. It really isn't a bad game and maybe it's something that I should try again if I ever find the time. The Sword of Hope is a first-person RPG by Kimco. I bought this game way back when because it reminded me a lot of Shadowgate and I really liked that game at the time. And it plays very similar to that. Your play screen is menu driven and all the commands are self-explanatory. Be sure to look at everything as you might find items on the ground or people might give you hints if you look at them more than once. Your field of view is tiny and if you're playing on the Game Boy it's even more minuscule so I hope you have some really good vision. This is one game that you'll want to use graph paper to make a map. If you don't you will get lost. The developers must have figured this out so they gave you a magic spell that takes you back to the old man's house. The game has a good story and the music is unmistakably Kimco style and I like that. The only real downfall of this game is that you get caught in way too many battles and there are times when you'll have 4 or 5 in a row. Still this is actually a fun game if you're up for this style of RPG. Donkey Kong showed up on the Game Boy. Many games have their own border image and in-game palettes if you play them on the Super Game Boy and Donkey Kong here was the very first to do so. You start out by playing what appears to be a simple port of the arcade game. And it is. You've got four levels to rescue Paulina. Donkey Kong himself has been updated to be wearing his tie. Such a classy guy. They even employed the Super Nintendo sound chip complete with mild reverb for Paulina's screams. Anyway, after you get past these four levels, you expect to go back to level one. Well, you do go to level one, but now it's level one of the new game. They've added a lot more stuff here, and it's pretty cool. Donkey Kong keeps taking your woman behind locked doors. And since he's a complete dumbass, he leaves the key to the door somewhere in the level. You need to maneuver to the key and pick it up Mario 2 style and take it to the locked door. Then you go on to the next level. The game even has save spots, and it's all really well put together. This is a really nice package and I recommend it to everybody, especially Donkey Kong fans. Things moved forward with Donkey Kong Land which was an interpretation of Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo. Check it out, Silicon Graphics on Game Boy! See? Any system really can do these kinds of graphics. This is also another game that displays its own border and color palette when it's played on the Super Game Boy. Anyway, this one plays pretty much exactly like Donkey Kong Country with its own unique stages, mostly unique anyway. Except this time you don't see Diddy Kong on the screen at the same time as you. If you take a hit, you go away and Diddy comes in to take over. If you find another barrel and free Donkey Kong, then the same thing will happen but in reverse if you take another hit. It works fairly well and it's a nice compromise to get it to fit on the Game Boy. The control itself feels good, but the game does have some issues. First and foremost, a lack of color really makes it hard to distinguish the enemies and other hazards since everything has that same grainy silicon graphics look to it. And secondly, it can sometimes be hard to do what you want to do. Like here, I just want to bounce on this lizard enemy, but I keep grabbing the ropes every time I jump. There's no room to jump anywhere but in front of the ropes. Also, since the screen is so zoomed in, you never know if there's a platform you can land on below you or not. Otherwise, this game is pretty good with some nice music. Then came Donkey Kong Land 2. This one improves on a few things for sure. First and foremost, the enemies are now much easier to make out against the background. The control also seems much smoother and even more responsive. This one plays like Donkey Kong Country 2 with Diddy and Dixie in the lead. This also has its own Super Game Boy background as well, and most stages have their own set of colors. In fact, when you first start the game, you might even think it's a Game Boy Color game, but it's not. Definitely check this one out, I think it's the best of the bunch. Tetris on the Game Boy is a great port of the puzzler. This is the version that I've spent most of the time with since it came with my system. It has a perfect gameplay and a soundtrack that is amazing. 
I've spent many hours playing and trying to get as many lines as possible. To me, it was all about how many lines I could get, not the score. Then I played B mode, just looking for a great challenge. Oh, I found a challenge all right, and I'd played this with the stats turned all the way up. It was fun and very frustrating because I'd play and lose and lose and lose, but I'd never give up. Then all of a sudden I got a great setup and the blocks fell like they should and I cleared all 25 lines. I was treated to a really cool ending with all the Russian dancers and then the space shuttle launched. It was a very sweet moment. Another very addictive puzzler by Nintendo is of course Dr. Mario. I never played a lot of this game back in the day as it just wasn't as appealing as Tetris. But as time went by I played more and more and I eventually became addicted. The concept is very simple and all you have to do is eliminate viruses by matching them with the drugs that Mario is throwing in the jar. It's easy and fun but it gets super hard in the upper levels. To top it all off you get a soundtrack with two great songs that are very memorable. Solomon's Club published by Tecmo is another fun puzzle game. This one's more action oriented as you control a wizard named Dana. Dana must get the key in each area and open the door to exit onto the next level. You can make blocks to help you build steps to get to where you need to go. You can also break blocks that are in your way. Breaking a block with an enemy on it will make them fall to their death. There's lots of things to collect besides the key which will give you points, extra lives and more. The music is pretty good and the game plays great on the Game Boy. If you're into puzzlers like this I'd recommend it. Wow, that's a lot of black and whiteness so far. Hey, it's easy on the eyes. Look at it that way. Not when they're zoomed up all the way to the <laughs> full screen. I don't know. I love it. I love it. You knew I'd love this whole episode, and we're only part of the way through it. So let's just get right back into it. Balloon Kid is a follow-up to Balloon Fight, which was on the NES. This one plays more like the balloon trip part of that game. In the beginning of the game, you ship your son off on a set of balloons hoping to make the news and maybe even land a reality TV show. Kinda like Balloon Boy. Anyone remember Balloon Boy? Oh well. Anyway, you realize your mistake and you take off in your own set of balloons to go get your son. And on the way, you want to collect as many balloons as possible. Well actually, you don't have to, but they're worth points and you want lots of points. You tap button A for a burst of height, but you can also land on the ground just as long as it's not covered with danger. Pressing B will cause you to let go from your balloons. If your balloons touch an enemy, one of them will pop. You can still run around on the ground if you don't have any balloons. This is a pretty fun game for the Game Boy, but honestly, only in short bursts. Now let's take a look at Kid Icarus of Myth and Monsters. Full disclosure, I don't know a whole lot about the original game as the only things that appealed to me at the time were the fact that you could shoot up and the music. This version seems to play in a very similar fashion only the music isn't anywhere near as catchy. You can shoot across or up and hearts are still your currency. Speaking of which, the stores here are damned expensive. 20 entire hearts for a hammer? These are given away multiple times in any level. There's lots of different rooms you can go into and some of them have advice for you or maybe even some creatures to fight. Your goal in most of the levels is to make it to the top of the stage and into the exit, but the labyrinths are also back. Uh, don't worry though as you have a completely useless map at your disposal. You can break certain blocks with your hammer and these usually reveal special stuff to collect. The control is decent though the game feels very slow and floaty. It's a decent game but it's certainly nothing I'd personally pay more than $5 for. Trax is a fun and unique game developed by HAL Laboratories and released by Electrobrain. In this one you go on a cute killing spree destroying everything that you see to satiate your lust for death and destruction. The good people are just trying to defend themselves and of course they try to stop you. Basically button B fires your gun and button A rotates your turret of death. But it can only rotate clockwise so be careful. You shoot down enemy vehicles, trees, homes, warehouses, you name it. No amount of death is too much for you and your cute little tank. 
you can pick up some cool power-ups to help you out with your murder spree, including a three-way shot and other things. It's up to you to decide if your current weapon is better at death than the one you can pick up. Your life bar is over on the right. If that runs out, you lose your life. I'm sure you would have never have guessed that, right? Anyway, if you pick up fuel tanks, they restore some of your life bar, so maybe it's a fuel gauge. The stages are pretty long, and there's mid-bosses as well as stage bosses to murder. There can be a lot of slowdown when a lot of innocent defenders crowd the screen. And crowd it, they do. It can be really challenging sometimes if you want to kill everybody. The music works for the game, and it seems kind of happy for a wartime game. But then again, you're a happy little tank. Overall, it's really not bad at all, and I recommend it if you can find it for a few bucks. Revenge of the Gator is a pinball game by HAL. It's a fun game, but it has one flaw that can be frustrating, which I'll get to soon. The game controls well, flippers are responsive, and the ball physics are fairly realistic. There's only one game board here with four screens. Each screen has plenty of stuff that you can try and hit with your ball. In fact, sometimes it feels that there's too much on the screen and you feel cramped. Moving the ball up the board takes some practice and a lot of luck. This is where I feel the main flaw is. Like here, I've worked my ass off to get this gate open so I can move up the board. Once I get up to the next area, it doesn't take me long to mess up and get knocked back down a screen. Instead of the gate remaining open, it's closed! What the hell? No! This gate should always be open after you've opened it once. I don't know if it's by design or an overlooked flaw, but it sure is frustrating. Otherwise, the game is fun, has decent graphics, secret rooms, and a looping track that gets annoying kinda quickly. After this, Hal went on to make Kirby's Pinball Land. I feel they went all out with this one and almost perfected video pinball here. This game has three different fields to choose from. All of them are really well designed and have tons of animation. Again, each board has four screens and the only thing that I wish was there was smooth scrolling between each screen. When your ball flops between two screens, it can get quite disorienting. The play fields seem to have more room and aren't as claustrophobic. There's a few bonus rooms on each board and also a boss fight waiting for you at the top. These are tough, but they're really fun. The music is pure Kirby awesomeness and I never get sick of it. What a great game this is and if I were you I'd buy it for your 3DS from the eShop. Since we're talking about hell here, let's take a look at their other Kirby games. I mean why the hell not? Kirby's Dreamland was released in 1992. This was his first adventure game and it's a very solid experience. I had a really fun time playing this game back in the day and I was a Kirby fan ever since. There's only two problems that this game has. Firstly, Kirby hasn't gained his ability to steal enemy powers. For me, this isn't a big deal since this is how I knew the game originally. People that are used to current Kirby games and go back and try this one most likely won't like it. Secondly, the game is over before you know it. You can beat it in less than 45 minutes. Still though, it's a great experience. Kirby's Dream Land 2 came out several years later. This game does let you steal enemy powers, which of course is awesome. It also has helper characters in the form of animals. These are okay, I'm just not a big fan of them. I'd much rather just have Kirby alone and that's it. This entry is definitely longer than the first and actually has 7 worlds with between 3 to 5 levels each and a boss fight. This is a much more fleshed out game than the first and it feels like it. The control is great and of course the music is fantastic. HAL is one amazing company and I'm glad that Nintendo has them on their side. Let's check out Operation C from Konami. This is basically a retooling of Super C on the NES. This was released back when they were afraid to call Contra Contra. Anyway, I feel that this one was more successful than the Castlevania Game Boy games in actually bringing the player a portable version of the game. Playing this, it absolutely feels like a Contra game through and through, and that's because it is. Almost everything you know and love about Contra is here. You've got side-scrolling run-and-gun action, but this time the weapons can be powered up, so you can get a spread that features twice as many bullets. Or you can get a heat-seeking version of the same weapon. I like these additions, and it really makes the game more enjoyable. 
Of course, you have the overhead missions as well. Some people hate these stages. Personally, I like them. The graphics are fantastic for the Game Boy, and the music is straight from Super C, only better now because it's in stereo. By default, you only get three continues, but I'm sure there's a code out there to help you if you really need it. This one is a must-have. There's also Contra The Alien Wars, which was made by Factor 5. This, of course, is a direct port of Contra 3 on the Super Nintendo. I'm surprised at how well it came out, actually. It's pretty damn faithful, all things considered. Gone, however, is the ability to wield two weapons at a single time and also the two-player mode, which, of course, is to be expected. Still, pretty much everything is here, just scaled way, way back. The overhead levels are here, but, of course, they don't rotate. I recall most people hating those levels in the Super Nintendo version with a flaming passion. Again, I actually like them, though they're a lot slower and a bit tougher here. The graphics are all pretty good and the control is decent. The music is also pretty faithful and it's fun to hear Game Boy renditions of the original tunes. This is a good game, but I think that Operation C is the better Contra experience overall for the Game Boy. We should probably mention a few games that everyone else talks about, like Super Mario Land. Yeah, Dave's talked about these before, but here's my brief take. Of course, this was one of the launch games. I remember thinking how tiny everything looked and how extremely simple the graphics were. Honestly, it really turned me off as a potential customer for the Game Boy. Back then, I wanted games to take a step forward, not backwards. Anyway, I never really bothered to play this one until a few years ago. It's actually a pretty good game and definitely a unique one in the Mario universe. Yeah, the graphics pretty much suck, but the music is outstanding. What is it with Game Boy launch titles having such amazing music? Can someone tell me? Anyway, it plays pretty well, but it's kind of slippery as Mario games tend to be. Now, I generally like Mario games more or less, but as a character, I pretty much despise him. I know, I know, opinions like that are simply not allowed. Still, it's a good game with some slight nods to the original NES version. Hell, I'll tell you what, I'd rather play this than the original. Two years later, Super Mario Land 2, six golden coins came around. The graphics are no longer tiny, in fact, everything is quite large. Small Mario looks bigger here than Big Mario does in a lot of other games. This one looks and plays a lot more like Super Mario World and it has a really nice overworld map. What's nice is that you can visit most parts of the map right away. The game also has you acquiring special abilities like a hat that'll let you float if you get the radish. There are lots and lots of places to explore and this one will keep you busy for a while. The controls still feel a bit slippery and like most Game Boy games that are so zoomed in, it feels kind of floaty as well. I like this a lot more than the first Super Mario Land with the exception of the music. Most of the music here is decent, I guess. Some of it is awful though, like in the pumpkin zone. Still, if you like Mario, you're gonna love this game. Nemesis is a shooter by Ultra who is a subsidiary of Konami. This was the first shooter that I bought for my Game Boy back in 1990. The game plays exactly like Gradius with a power-up system of collecting jewels. Each weapon on the weapon bar takes a certain amount of these jewels to activate and you can only activate it when it's highlighted. It's a strange system and can be kind of annoying at times. You're always watching this bar calculating how many more jewels you need for the weapon you want. And if you collect too many then you have to cycle through the bar again. This entry for the system feels like a mix of Gradius and Salamander with some levels having an organic feel to them. The game is short with only 5 levels and I beat it in just over a half hour. It's a fun experience because your ship controls really well and as you can see the graphics are quite amazing for the Game Boy. There's tons of details in all the sprites. The soundtrack is also really good with melodies from previous games and also some new stuff too.
Gradius 2, which is Nemesis 2 in Japan, came out in 1992, but I didn't pick it up until 2012 or so. In actuality, I really don't remember seeing this game in stores or even advertised back in the day. I'm glad I found it because it's a fun experience just like the first title. This time around, the game is much harder and the levels are a lot longer. It still retains the same weapon system, so if you've played Gradius, you know what you're getting into. The game controls very well, but definitely get some power-ups right away since your ship is super slow. The graphics again are amazing, and even though the backgrounds are mostly non-existent, the levels and sprites have some of the most detail you'll see on the Game Boy. The music this time around has all new tracks and they sound great. A sound test was added, which is always a good idea. If you like Gradius at all, both of these games are well worth your investment. Metroid 2 Return of Samus is a sequel to the original Metroid. Duh! The story takes Samus to planet SR388, which is the Metroid creature's home planet. In this installment, Samus must find and defeat 39 Metroids, and when this is done it will open up the planet for further exploration. There's a counter on the bottom of the screen so you know how many Metroids are left to kill. It would have been nice to have a map of the planet, but it wasn't meant to be, so draw your own map. At least the game does have save points, which is awesome. Samus controls well, and as usual, she'll pick up items on the way to upgrade her suit and abilities. I really like the spider ball, as you can use it to roll up almost any wall and even ceilings. There's lots of hidden areas to discover, which can lead to necessary items like an energy tank. Definitely a worthy installment for the franchise, and a great addition to the Game Boy's library. Ninja Gaiden Shadow is a pretty nice game. This time you're fighting against an evil dictator whose power is the fear of mankind. He stores his despair in the skyscraper. Pretty heavy stuff. Anyway, we mentioned before that this was originally going to be a Shadow of the Ninja game and then Tecmo came along and acquired it and gave it a quick makeover. That doesn't in any way, shape, or form mean that this is a bad game. It's actually quite fun. You've got your trusty blade to dispatch enemies with. You also have your ninja magic or whatever they call it in the Ninja Gaiden world. I'm used to Shinobi, sorry. But now you also have a grapple hook that fires directly above you which will bring you up when you connect to a proper surface. So if you like James Pond 2 Robocod, then this is the version of Ninja Gaiden for you. The graphics are decent and the music is pretty good, but most importantly, it's a fun game to play. Sometimes I feel that my character can't quite react quickly enough to things, but it's still serviceable enough to play through. I definitely recommend giving this one a try. Space Invaders also showed up on the system. I know, I know, why the hell are we talking about boring old Space Invaders? Well, this one is in fact a little special. Upon starting the game you have a choice, at least if you're playing this on a Super Game Boy. Choose the Super Game Boy mode and this right here is what you'll get. Basic old Space Invaders. This was a game I was never tremendously good at. I seem to have a knack for completely missing even when the screen is full of alien ships. But whatever, it's Space Invaders. If you choose the Space Invaders Arcade mode, then something pretty cool happens. All of a sudden you get a sweet intro and things don't really look like a Game Boy game anymore. The Super Nintendo has completely taken over the graphics and sound now. Power, Power Plus. Plus! You choose from a few different screen settings and off you go. It's still Space Invaders, it's just powered by the Super NES and everything looks and sounds much better as a result. I think it's pretty cool that there's a game that even does this. Small Soldiers is also an interesting one, kinda. This is not a great game by any means, but I thought it'd be fun to show. Here's what it looks and sounds like when you're playing on the Game Boy. Well, plug it into a Super Game Boy and then it looks and sounds like this. Pretty big difference, especially in the music which is being handled by the Super Nintendo. As for the game itself, there's very little action and you mainly just jump from ledge to ledge to ledge. One button jumps and the other runs and supposedly attacks, but I couldn't get any attacks to ever happen. Anyway, these buttons are backwards on the controller, so it makes playing the game even more fun. Again, I really don't recommend this game, but it does more with the technology than most Game Boy games did.
just like I said, Joe, this was going to be a blast of an episode for me to make. Now, I'm going to ask you, of course, what you personally think of the Game Boy. Well, honestly, there are some great games to be had. There really are. Um, there are also some mm -hmm. piss poor games. Well, yeah, just um, like any system. Sure, but it, it's just something that I can't quite get into, even mm -hmm. though there are, you know, like I said, good games. Yeah, is it because know. the games run slower than like normal games? You know, because they had to probably to, for blurring factors. Well, I don't know what it is really. <laughs> it's just something that just there's just something that's not appealing. But I, like I said, I, I do really like the music in yes. a lot of those games. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you think about the Game Boy after your first experience? Of, you know? <laughs> my first experience or my current experience? <laughs> I've loved the Game Boy ever since I first started playing it. I remember mm -hmm. going to Target before it was released and actually sitting there with my friend playing Tetris like four nights a week. You know, during school, just going down there and go, oh, I want to play this. I want to play this. Huh. So yeah, I've been on board ever since the beginning. And this is your and favorite I, episode by far. Oh, yes, by far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what do you guys think of the Game Boy? What are some of your favorite games? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Mr. Yokoi, you remember that time that Joe smashed my Game Boy? <laughs> it's too painful. I miss it. And if you're listening, if you could give me my Game Boy back, that's all I really want. What? Mr. What? You did it! My Game Boy! <laughs> oh, well, you can keep that, though. I don't want that. Thank you. You gave me my Game Boy back. If you're still listening, can... Do you think I could have my hair back, too? Hello?